Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel or welcome to my channel if you are new. So today I am going to be reading Wings of Fire, the Dragon Art Prophecy by Ty T. Sutherland um, from chapter 1 to chapter 2. So anyway, let's begin. Part 1, Under the Mountain. Oh, also you guys can read along if you want to. Six Years Lake Dale, Chapter 1. Clay didn't think he was the right dragon for the big heroic destiny. Oh, he wanted to be. He wanted to be the great mudwing savior of the dragon world, glorious and brave. He wanted to do all the th wonderful things expected of him. He wanted to look at the world, figure out what was broken, and fix it. But he wasn't a natural hatched hero. He had no legendary qualities at all. He liked sleeping more than studying, and he kept losing chickens in the caves during hunting practice because he was paying attention to his friends instead of watching for feathers. He was all right at fighting, but all right wasn't going to stop the war and save the, all the dragon tribes. He needed to be extraordinary. He was the biggest dragonette, so he was supposed to be the scariest, the scary tough one. The minders wanted him to be terrifyingly dangerous. Clay felt as dangerous as a cauliflower. Fight! His attacker howl howled, flinging him across the cav cavern. Clay crashed into the rock wall and scrambled up again, trying to spread his mud-colored wings for balance. Red talons raked at his face and he ducked away. Come on, the red dragon snarled. Stop holding back and find the killer inside you let out. Ugh. Find the killer inside you and let it out. I'm trying, Clay said. Maybe if we could stop and and just talk about it she lunged for him again think to the left roll right use your fire clay tried to duck under her wing to attack her from below but of course he he rolled the wrong way one of her talons smashed him on the ground and he yelped with pain which left was that useless kestrel bell bellowed in his ear are all mud wings this stupid or are you just death well, if you keep that up, I will be soon, Clay thought. The Skywing lifted her claws, and he wiggled free. I don't know about the other Mudwings, he protested, licking his sore talons, obviously. But perhaps we could try fighting We could try fighting without all the shouting and see. He stopped, hearing the familiar hiss, hiss that came before one of Kestrel's fire attacks. He threw his wings over his head tucked his long neck in and rolled into the maze of stagmites that steadied one corner of the cave. Flames blasted the rocks around him, singeing the, top of the tip of his tail. Tower, the old dragon bellowed. She smashed one of the rock columns into a shower of sharp black pebbles. Clay covered his eyes and almost immediately felt her stamp down hard on his tail. Ow! He yelled. You said stomping tails was cheating. He seized the closest st stalagmite between his claws and scrambled up to the top of it. From his perch near the roof, he glared down at his guardian. I'm your teacher, Kestrel said. Nothing I do is considered cheating. Get down from here and fight like a skywing. But I'm not a skywing, Clay thought rebelliously. I'm a mudwing. I don't like setting things on fire or flopping around in circles biting at dragons' necks. His teeth still ached from Kestrel's jewel-hard scales. Can't I fight one of the others? he asked. I'm much better at that. The other dragons were his own size, nearly, and they didn't cheat, well, most of the, most of the time. He actually liked fighting with them. Oh yes? Which opponent would you prefer? The stunted sandwing or the lazy rainwing? Kestrel said, because I'm sure you'll get to choose out on the battlefield. Her tail glowed like embers as she lashed it back and forth. Glory's not lazy, Clay said loyally. She's just not built for fighting, that's all. Webb says there's not much to fight about in the rainforest because the rainwings have all the food they want. He says that's why they've stayed out in of the war so far because none of the rival queens want rain wings in their in their army armies anyway he says stop yammering and get down here kestra roared he's she reared up on her back legs and flared her wings so she suddenly looked three times bigger with a yelp of alarm clay tried to leap from the next to the next stalagmite 
but his wings unflurred too, too slowly and he smacked into the side of it instead. Sparks flew as his claws scraped down the jagged rock. He let out another yowl of pain as Kestrel shaked her head between the columns, seized uh, sorry, seized his tail in her teeth and yanked him out into the open. Her talons closed around his neck as she hissed in his ear. Where's the violent little monster I saw when you hatched? That's the dragon we need for the prophecy. Gopclay squawked, clawing at her grip. He could feel the strange burn scars on her palms scraping against his scales. This was how battle training this was how battle training with Castor always ended, with him unconscious and then sore or limping for days afterwards. Fight back, he thought. Get mad, do something. But although he he was the biggest of the dragonettes. They were still a year away from being full grown, and Kestrel towered over him. He tried to summon some painful, violent rage, but all that he could think about was, it'll be over soon, and then I can go have dinner. So, not the most heroic train of thought. Suddenly, Kestrel t let out a roar and dropped him. Fire blasted over Clay's head as he hit the floor with a thud. The red dragon roared whirled around behind her panting def definitely pan uh, behind her panting definitely was the sea winged dragonette tsunami a red gold scale had caught between her sharp white teeth she spat it out and glared at their teacher stop picking on clay tsunami growled or i'll bite you again her deep blue scale shimmered like cobble cobble glass in the torchlight the gills of her the gills in her long neck were pulsing like they always did when she was angry. Kestrel sat back and flicked her tail around, around to examine the bite mark. She bared her teeth at Tsunami. Aren't you sweet, protecting a dragon who tried to kill you while you were still an egg? But luckily, you big dragons were there to save our lives, Tsunami said. And we sure appreciated it, because now we get to hear all... Uh, now we get to hear about it all the time. She marched around to stand between Clay and Kestrel. Clay winced. He hated hearing this story. He didn't understand it. He had wanted. He never wanted to hurt the other dragonettes. So why had he attacked their eggs during his hatching? Did he really have a killer monster inside of him somewhere? The other minders, Webs and Dune, said he'd been ferocious when he hatched. They'd said. They'd had to throw him in the river to protect the other eggs with, from him. Kestra wanted him to find the monster and use it when he fought, but he was afraid if he did, if he ever did, he would hate himself, and so would everyone else. Thinking about it, he'd done. Thinking about what he'd done to his friends made him feel like all the fire had been sucked out of him. He didn't particularly. Part Particularly want to be violent, want to be a violent, angry monster, even if Kestrel thought that would be an improvement. But maybe that was the only way to make the prophecy come true. Maybe that monster was his destiny. All right, Kestrel said dismissively. We're finished here anyway. I'll mark another failure on your scroll, Mudwing. She snorted a small flame into the air and swept out of the cave. Clay flopped down on the floor as soon as her red tail had vanished from the sight from sight. It felt like every one of his scales was stinging from the burns. She's going to be so mean to you during your training tomorrow, he said to Tsunami. Oh no, the seeming Dragonette gasped. I've never seen Kestrel be mean. That's so unexpected and out of character. Ow, Clay groaned. Don't make me laugh. I think my ribs are broken. Yours are not broken, Tsunami said, poking him in the side with her nose. Dragon bones are, as, are almost as hard as diamonds. You're fine. Get up and jump in the river. No, Clay buried his head, buried his head under his wing. It's too cold. Jump in the river was Tsunami's solution for everything. Bored, aching bones, dry scales, brain overstuffed with history of the war. Jump in the river, she'd shout whenever any of the other dragonettes complained. She certainly did not think, did not care that she was almost... She was the only one who would breathe, who could breathe underwater, or that most other dragon tribes hated getting wet. Clay didn't mind being wet, but he couldn't stand being cold. And the underground river was flowed, 
flowed through their cave home was always was almost freezing. Get in, Tsunami ordered. She seized his tail between her front talons and started dragging him toward the river. You'll feel better. I will not, Clay shouted, clawing at the smooth stone floor. I'll feel colder. Stop it. Go away. Urgh. His protests went up in a cloud of bubbles as Tsunami dumped him in the icy water. When he resurfaced, she was floating beside him, beside him, ducking her head and splashing over the and splashing water over her scales like a beautiful overgrown fish. Clay felt the gawky brown felt like a gawky brown blob next to her. He splashed in he splashed sploshed into the shallows and lay down on a submerged rock ledge, and his head rested on the bank of the river. He couldn't admit it, but the burns and aches did feel better in the water. The current helped wash away the smoky rock dust caught between his dry scales. Still too cold, though. Clay scratched at the rock below him. Why couldn't there just be a little mud down there? Castro will be so sorry one day when I'm queen of the sea wings, Tsunami said swimming up and down in the narrow channel. I thought only a queen's daughters or sisters could challenge her for the throne, Clay said. So, Tsunami swam so fast. She wished he had webbed ta- he had webbed <sighs> he wished he had webs between his talons too, or gills, or a tail like hers, so powerful she could nearly empty the river with one big splash. Well, maybe the sea wing queen is my mother, and I'm the lost princess, she said. Like in the story, everything the dragonettes knew about the outside world was outside world came from squirrels picking up by the towns of peace. Their favorite one was the missing princess, a legend about a runaway skywing dragonette with royal family tore up the whole world o- up the whole ocean looking for her. At the end, she found her way home, and her parents welcomed her with open wings and feasting and joy. Clay always skipped the adventures in the middle of the story. He just liked the last part, the happy mother and father, and the feasting. The feasting sounded pretty great, too. I wonder what my parents are like, he said. I wonder if any of our parents are still alive, Tsunami said. Clay didn't like to think about that. He knew dragons were dying in the war every day. Castro and Webbs brought back news of bloody battles, scorched land, and burning piles of dragon bodies. But he had to believe his parents were still alive. Do you think they ever miss us? Definitely. Tsunami flicked a spray of water at him with her tail. I bet they... I bet mine were frantic when Webb stole my egg, just like in the story. And mine tore apart the marshes, Clay said. They'd all imagined scenes of their parents' desperate searches ever since they were young dragonettes. Clay liked the idea that someone out there was looking for him, that someone missed him and wanted him back. Tsunami flipped over flipped onto her back, gazing up at the stone roof and her tent and with her translucent green eyes. Well, the talents of peace knew what they were doing, she said bitterly. No one would ever find us down here. They listened to the river gurgle and the torches crackle for a moment. We won't be underground forever, Clay said, trying to make her feel better. I mean, if the talents of peace want, want us to stop this war, they have to let us out sometime. He scratched between the, his ears thoughtfully. Starflight says it's only two more years. He only had to hold on to the. He only had to hold on to that. He only had to hold on that long, and then we can go home and eat as many cows as we want. Well, first we have to save the world, Tsunami said, and then we go home. Right, said Clay. How are we go? How are, were they going to save the world? was a little fuzzy, but everyone seemed to think they'd figure it out when the time came. Clay pulled himself out of the river, his waterlogged wings heavy and drooping. He spread them in a f- in front of one of the uh, uh, in front of one of the torches, arching his neck and trying to get warm. Feeble waves of heat wafted against his scales. Unless tsunami said clay lowered his head to look at her unless what unless we leave sooner she said she flipped over and pulled herself out of the water in one graceful motion leave clay echoed startled how on our own 
Why not? She said. If we can find a way out, why would we have to wait for another two years? Oh, it looks like I'm running out of time. Sorry. Really fast intro. Bye. I'll finish chapter two in my next